uh, Paul Moraf from Cogstate here. Uh, I'd like to share with you some uh, data that we presented recently at the Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease conference. There is now a reconsideration of the extent to which uh, amelioration of acetylcholine neurotransmission may provide an interesting and, 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 and useful therapeutic approach uh, in Alzheimer's disease. So as we now understand about the biology of Alzheimer's disease and its particular, its amyloid uh, processes, uh, this has allowed us an opportunity to reconsider um, the way in which acetylcholine neurotransmission is um, disrupted in the disease and sort of provides for us a framework by which we might consider using drugs that we've used in the past again in Alzheimer's disease. So what we're doing now here is to try and understand something of a biological framework to help us make decisions in, in that case. And what we're doing is looking in this study at the extent to which we can find very early in the disease evidence that those neurons in the brain that are associated with acetylcholine neurotransmission are disrupted specifically. If you can see data that we published now many years ago, almost 10 years ago, uh, and it, what it does is it shows the increase in amyloid level that occurs when detected from PET scan through the natural history of the disease. Um, you can see the 100 CL line, the CL denotes centeloid, uh, and that's the level of amyloid that you see typically in people with clinically diagnosed dementia uh, of Alzheimer's disease. You can see that the 20 centeloid line uh, is that level at which we believe amyloid is considered within normal limits. And so that trajectory from 20 to 100 centeloids uh, is the course of the disease. Uh, and that from this estimate is about 20 to 30 years. So this disease is developing for over many, many years, decades in fact, where we've got an opportunity to intervene and modulate or change that course um, by using medicines. And as you know, uh, recently drugs have been approved to sort of disrupt amyloid accumulation. And the area that I'm interested in is that area that goes from time zero, where the amyloid accumulation just passes the 20 centeloid criterion to the 40 centeloid criterion, which currently by current definitions is sort of what we would call preclinical Alzheimer's disease. So what we're looking at here is the degeneration or evidence for the degeneration of, of cholinergic neurons before people meet clinical criteria for preclinical Alzheimer's disease. But essentially what we've done is taken people from the ABLE sample who are cognitively unimpaired, but also the level of amyloid in their brain is defined as being negative or normal. Um, and that is because when they were scanned at their baseline, the level of amyloid was under 20 centeloids. And that group is represented by the, the two figures on the left. And the data for those people and their amyloid burden uh, is broken by those who carry the ApoE4 allele, indicated here by E4 amyloid negative, and those who don't carry the ApoE4 levels, non-E4 on the left with the green line. Just for reference, if you look to the very right of the figure, you can see group of people who are classified as preclinical Alzheimer's disease. So what this data shows is that even in people who are amyloid negative, carriage of the ApoE4 allele is associated with a subtle increase in amyloid accumulation over many years. And that accumulation is detectable prior to their meeting any clinical criteria for, for um, Alzheimer's disease having started. So we term this stage of the disease emergent Alzheimer's disease. That is pre-preclinical Alzheimer's disease. So this provides us with an opportunity to ask, in this very early stage of the disease, can we see any evidence of symptomatic change or neuronal loss? So if we go to symptomatic change, 
Uh, here, what we've done is, is, is superimposed performance on a test of memory, a test of attention and a test of executive function in those people. And so what you can see for um, APOE4 carriage in amyloid negative people, uh, the APOE4 carriage is associated with a loss of memory to a greater extent than, uh, than in the E4 non-carriers. But there's no difference between carriers and non-carriers in any change in their attentional function or any change in their executive function. So the first thing is, in this very, very early stage of the disease, um, amyloid is accumulating and memory decline is already apparent, although it's highly, highly subtle. Okay, we get to the point that we're interested in with this study. And what we've done is looked at the volumes of two main areas of the brain, the basal forebrain and two, two sub-regions of the basal forebrain, CH4P, which is the nucleus bacillus of Minot, and uh, CH1, CH2, the medial septal band. And essentially the CH4P is the, the cholinergic rich uh, area of, of, of the basal forebrain, whereas CH1, CH2 is less so. And then on the right, just for reference, is the hippocampus. And we're saying that in uh, people who are amyloid negative, uh, is there a loss of volume in cholinergic regions of the basal forebrain, suggesting that this is involved early on? The summary is that despite us finding uh, amyloid levels increase to a greater extent in APOE4 carriers who are amyloid negative, and us finding that memory deterioration is slightly greater in people who are APOE4 carriers and amyloid negative, that we can detect no difference between cholinergic rich neurons or basal forebrain neurons uh, in these groups, suggesting that amyloid accumulation actually precedes loss of cholinergic neurons in, in this area. Uh, just giving here a, 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 a summary of the table where what we've done is, is, is given the comparison of uh, amyloid negative E4 carriers to non-E4 carriers for the PET amyloid, for the uh, uh, neuronal uh, volumes and for the cognitive tests. And you can see where I've put the asterisks, the Cohen's D values for those comparisons uh, are indicated just by the fact that they're quite, uh, that they're, they're non-trivial in magnitude. If you look at the other aspects of cognition, you can see that the Cohen's D is negligible, close to zero. Uh, so certainly no difference there. If you look at the, um, the middle part of the table where it's looking at volumes, you can see that compared to the hippocampus, the, uh, the differences between slopes for the um, basal forebrain subregions are also negligible or trivial, and so there's nothing there. So I think we can integrate those three pieces of information to say that at least when we're looking at volume as a marker of cholinergic uh, or dysfunction of the cholinergic system, that there's no evidence that this occurs prior to the accumulation of amyloid. Uh, and if we consider the data that we showed before in preclinical Alzheimer's disease, it sort of requires that stage of the, uh, of the illness for, for this uh, volume loss to occur. But I hope you found that interesting. And I think what it does is provides us with a basis to start to consider how we might design studies where in amyloid positive people, we look to ameliorate loss of cholinergic neurotransmission by replacing it with drugs that actually actually act to, um, to promote uh, that in different ways. Thank you very much.